Hello and welcome to Man's Model Moments. Following on from part 4 of my 124th Airfix Spitfire Mark 9 build, in today's video I'm going to be putting the finish on the Spitfire and ending on our 4 month odyssey with Airfix's pinnacle release of 2022. Now just to remind you, this is where we left our Spitfire, in bare metal and red dope, ready for her paint, at the end of the last video. Now to start with, I wanted to do some pre-shading on the panel lines, which I did with matte black through the airbrush. I wasn't concerned about being too careful here, this was just to help with the tonal variation of the top coat. I also did this on all of the unattached pieces, masking where necessary, like on the inner cockpit door. I did the same on the airframe, taking particular care to mask the cockpit with a combination of sponge, tissue and artist masking fluid. Undercarriage and wheel wells were covered with tissue and sealed with more artist masking fluid, and once all that was dry, the undersurfaces were given a light misting of medium sea grey from Hataka Hobbies. In fact, all the base colours used here were Hataka Hobbies. I then lightened this slightly with some light grey, and highlighted the centre of the panels to add to the contrast from the pre-shading. This looks extreme here, but is more subtle once everything is dry. Turning to the upper surfaces, I wanted to preserve the base pre-shading, so out came the masking fluid again. Getting the main shapes of the camouflage scheme is most easily done by hand, so I used a small micro applicator as a brush to draw on the pattern, taking care to reference the guide at all times. Once I was happy with the outlines, I then filled in the main areas using a pointed cotton bud, which allows large volumes to be applied but still gives decent control. In World War II, the RAF didn't paint markings on top of camouflage, since this would have been a waste of paint, so markings were applied to the base and masked off. To try to preserve that look and feel with the decals and the pre-shading coming through, I used a compass cutter to create paper masks for both the wings and the fuselage, attaching these with more masking fluid. Here you can see the Spitfire all ready, with masking all in place, ready for its first camo coat. I started out misting ocean grey over the airframe. Then when that was complete and dry, removing the masking fluid and going over the unpainted areas with dark green. Here I'm not using any masking, just taking my time and freehanding the edges. Painting of Spitfire was done by airgun, and an overlap of 1-2 to two inches of overspray was called for, which is 1-2mm to two millimeters in 124 scale, which I wasn't far off from here. base coat supplied, it was time for some chipping. I went over the airframe, concentrating on fastenings that would be regularly opened and closed, such as those around the Hispano ammo storage. As you can see, I'm just using a dampened cocktail stick to lightly remove some of the paint from these, and along selected panel edges. Deckling was next, and I started with the big overwing roundels. As I normally do, I used pledge under the decal, wetting the entire area before bringing in the roundel to slide it over onto the wing. Mm -hmm. 
More pledge was applied over the top and brushed over to ensure the whole thing was completely covered. The same process was repeated with the fuselage roundels, and it has to be said that the decals supplied are absolutely fantastic. They are thin, colour dense and easy to work with. You can also see the sky fuselage band here that I applied before any other painting, but completely forgot to film. When almost dry, I went back to the wing roundels and pressed the decal into the access panels which could be removed, and used a new scalpel blade to cut along these, using a pointed cotton bud to smooth the decal before and after to prevent any possibility of tearing. When dry, you can see the decals have excellent confirmation to the model, nicely setting in all the rivets and lines. I went back again and ensured the cuts in those removable panels, and then used pledge along these edges to help draw them firmly back down onto them. Next it was time to create some colour variations using oil paints. These act as a filter to create small visual differences in surface colour and make it look more natural to our eyes. As you can see, I'm using a large range of different colours here to achieve this, and if you haven't ever tried this, it's well worth giving a go. To actually implement the effect, just dab tiny spots of oil paint randomly over the surface of your painted model. For the underside here, you can see I'm using grey, white, black, brown and blue. Once done, take some mineral spirit, I'm using odorless thinners here as they're more pleasant to work with, and then just dab this onto your oils, dispersing them over and creating a small transparent filter over your main scheme. There's no right or wrong here, and you can go back and rework it or apply more spirit or colour as you wish. This is also useful to help integrate your decals into the overall scheme, making them seem more weathered and painted on, rather than being separate entities, which can detract from your model's overall look. Now if you are doing oil filters, you do need to protect them if you're then going to use oil-based washes or weathering on top, since that will dissolve them. As such, here I'm putting an overall coat of pledge on this model to seal that layer in. This will also act as my gloss coat for the other decal applications. Before that, however, it was time to spray the yellow leading edges. Having masked off the area with Tamiya tape and paper, I then sprayed these Vallejo Squid Pink. The 
I also did the same with the prop tips. Now before you think I've gone completely insane, I did then use Vallejo Flat Yellow to go over these areas. The reason I sprayed them pink first is that pink covers darker colours much better than yellow as it has more white in it and it really makes for a rich yellow top coat as I hope you can see here. Try it, you'll be surprised how well it works. Dickling then proceeded as normal using my standard pledge as my single decal solution. Again, Efix provide a great set of decals here with extensive stencils and the like, which are pretty easy to work with and conform really well to the surface. Getting into the final stages, I then started to fit those pieces I'd left off for separate painting. First of these were the underwing radiators, applied with Tamiya Extra Thin, and these are a very positive and snug fit. The rear radiator flaps I didn't even cement, as they friction fit perfectly, meaning I could change their positioning if I wanted in the future. Going back to the props, the painting guide calls for a 4.2mm yellow tip, and I measured this with vernier calipers, and then masked them with Tamiya tape. I then sprayed them with golden so flat black, When dry, they were unmasked, ready for their decals. The prop decals themselves go on easily, again using Pledge. Which I also covered the whole prop in for a consistent finish. I lightly brushed over areas I was working on with Spirit, then used my homemade oil washes to lime these. The spirit just helps the wash flow into the recessed areas a little easier. Here's the entire aircraft with the wash applied, ready for me to come back when it's dry to remove the excess with makeup applicators. The process here is simple, just requiring a gentle rubbing across the surface to remove the excess wash, leaving it in the recesses of panel lines and rivets. These makeup applicators are great because they're very soft and are unlikely to damage your finish, which can sometimes be the case with cotton butts. If you do find they're not removing what you need them to, you can add a tiny amount of spirits to help, but generally it's just a matter of patience and perseverance. It was at this point I realised I was an idiot and had completely forgotten the underwing roundels, so I had to go back and apply these complete with cutting the access panel lines as for the upper decals. In addition, I also had to cut the ejector ports from the decal, which required a sharp blade and some dexterity, but was otherwise fine. some more pledge and patience, and I could go back and line these with wash as for the rest of the airframe. Weathering was next, and for these I used my own weathering pigments, applied with a small brush. The great thing about powders for this sort of smoke staining is that it's quite subtle and easy to build up. 
I used a mixture of black and brown to achieve this on the wing cannon and machine gun ports, including over the decals. For the engine exhausts and the fuselage staining, I used more browns and light grey, making sure to not let the powder build up or stain the wing roots. Following that, I gave the whole model a coat of Army Painter Matte Varnish to seal everything before carefully removing all of the masking. Now it was time for all the fiddly little bits. First of these were the aircraft navigation lights, which I painted with Tamiya gloss red and green before hand painting them in their respective camo colours. These were then easily added to the wingtips with Tamiya extra thin and the aid of a fine pair of tweezers. Next up was the large IFF light on top of the aircraft behind the radio mast, which fits snugly and was secured with extra thin as well. The central underside light was also pretty easy. As were the landing gear bay doors though I did clamp these once glued just to ensure they were firmly cemented before continuing. For the radio aerial itself, I used 0.2mm monofilament. In order to get a non-sagging line, I drilled very small holes in the tail and then completely through the radio mast itself. This is a delicate and awkward task, but not too bad as long as you don't try to rush it. Once completely through the mast, I trimmed off any spurs with a sharp blade and then dipped the end of the line in super glue and inserted it into the tail hole, allowing it to completely dry before continuing. The other end was then threaded through the mast which allows super glue to be placed on the line just before it and then the line pulled through and given a tiny amount of tension to keep it taut whilst the glue dries. Once dry, the excess can be trimmed flush with a sharp blade. The line is inserted into the fuselage in a similar manner, and then pulled up to meet the other line and super glued into place. Again, once completely dry, the excess was trimmed off with pointed side cutters. Next up was the attachment to the cockpit door, which was cemented with Tamiya Extra Thin after removing a thin line of paint on the connecting surfaces. Now the small thing that was preventing me finishing this video was the rear view mirror, which I carefully painted, glossed, and then misplaced. 
As this is a really prominent external feature, I couldn't just leave it off, so I made a replacement using the older square type mirror supplied with the kit, cutting this down and attaching a cut down AFV lamp along with some sprue goo. Sanding this to shape, I was then able to paint it and add it to the canopy and call it done. So let's have a look at the finished model, Johnny Johnson's mount when he arrived as Wing Commander at Kenley in March 1943, almost exactly 80 years ago. So what do I think of the Airfix 124 scale Spitfire Mark 9C kit? Well, it's certainly a gold standard kit for the 21st century, and I wouldn't have any hesitation in recommending it to anyone who wants to recreate this iconic flying legend. I will say it's not a perfect kit, and there are a few areas which do stop me giving this my highest accolade, but that certainly does not detract from what a great job Airfix have done with the kit. So let's talk about pros and cons. First up, this is a beautifully engineered kit, and kudos to the designers at Airfix for making this a really well thought out and executed model. Secondly, the instructions are first class, and the three full colour foldouts for paint schemes are top of the game, way ahead of most producers in fact. The panel line and rivet detail is excellent, it's restrained and fine, but able to catch washes and really boost the appearance of the finished model. The cockpit detail is amazing, including a fabulous instrument panel that is probably the best I've ever seen in any kit I've done. The Merlin 60 series engine is likewise wonderfully recreated, and it would be a crime to not be able to show it off. There are also a really good range of build options in the kit, with different cannon blisters, cockpit details, different gun sights, rear stabilizers, early and late 9 production variant details, standard and LF clipped wings, and so on. With aftermarket decals, you could model a vast number of individual aircraft with this kit. The undercarriage assemblies here are really strong and sturdy, which may seem like a silly little thing, but in aircraft like the Spitfire and 109 with outwards folding gear, it's actually a really important practical point, because the last thing you want to do is break them after you've finished the kit. The decals, or decals, are fantastic. They have perfect register, dense colour, they're thin, and conforming whilst not breaking or tearing easily. Honestly, I can't say that I've used better even in the aftermarket space. Importantly, this kit builds a great model straight out of the box, as I've tried to show it in these videos, and without aftermarket items this is going to be a very pleasing model. Having said that, it's a perfect base for super detailing, and you don't really need to even go to the aftermarket items to achieve that, Wire, styrene and foil in a few places would really be enough. 
Now, these are really points to be aware of rather than criticisms, but I am a little puzzled by some of these because I think Airfix have self-inflicted some limitations on themselves here, which really stopped me giving this, you know, an absolute platinum level 100% score. So let's start with the obvious and pretty minor point that some cockpit items are overscaled. These are things like the brass piping and the seat belts, but not egregiously so, and these are easily replaced with wire and foil if you feel the need. If you don't, it's not going to spoil your enjoyment, in my opinion. Another heads up point rather than a fault is the, let's call it challenging nature of some of the areas of fit. For example, that one Merlin cooling pipe, which risks breaking the engine mount to get into place. The wing root fillers, which you really have to be careful with not to create large gaps. And the main undercarriage, which to use a rather dated and dubious phrase my father would have used, is tighter than a gnat's chuff. Now these are not really negatives, but they're just areas that you should be aware of so that you're careful so as not to damage anything when you're building. One piece that doesn't affect the overall look of the model, but is very frustrating, is that there is something wrong with the Hispano belt feed mechanism. It would be massively proud of the covers regardless of their thickness, which not only prevents you having the option to have the covers either modelled open or close without removing them, but it's just wrong. I'm not sure what the issue is here as I thinned the covers down until they were basically translucent and trimmed about a millimetre off the bottom of the mechanism and it still wouldn't fit, which is why I left them off and just decided to put them in if I did remove the covers. More perplexing are the emissions of some fairly obvious detail items. For example, the canopy opening and closing handles, both the standard and the emergency, are absent, and they're pretty obvious to see on a Spitfire. The Wing Commander pennant for Johnny Johnson's aircraft is not included on the decal sheet. Now, the former can be scratch-built easily, but the latter is a bit more difficult and just odd, as EN398 most definitely did have one. On the subject of decals, the decal colour for Sky for the aircraft markings is pretty lurid and out there, and it doesn't match most sky colours. Now I know the subject of sky as a colour is one that could probably span many videos by itself as it wasn't a set thing and it had a lot of range, but these are definitely on the extreme duck egg green end of the spectrum. As there is no sky fuselage band included, that is a bit of an issue as you either accept a mismatch, as I did for this build, or that you need to match the decal colour for the band and spinner, or overpaint the decals, or ditch them and buy new ones, which seems a real shame given how good the decals are. I'll probably return to these and overpaint them, because they do bug me a little bit now. Now, I don't want to end on a negative, however minor, so let me finish by saying that these small points in no way prevent me from recommending this kit. The nice thing about it is that you don't need to be an advanced modeler to make this, because it's so well engineered, someone with basic modeling skills and patience will find that they can manage this, and it looks tremendous when it's done. So well done Airfix. Now please, let's see a similar treatment of the Messerschmitt 109. That's all for this instalment of Man's Model Moments. If you enjoyed the video, please click the like button, subscribe to the channel for more like it, and share this video with others you think would also enjoy it. You can also follow me on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook, and if you're feeling generous then I also have a Patreon, which is absolutely the best way of helping me to grow the channel and produce more content like this. With that, I hope you have plenty of modelling moments of your own, and I look forward to welcoming you on the next video.